the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell. All right, welcome to week three in the Lori Vallow Daybell trial. We've been doing this uh, kind of wrap up each Friday and uh, this week we are getting into a lot of the nitty gritty in this trial. So excited to have you join us. I'm KSL News Radio reporter Amy Kobe, but joined by my colleague Hugo and we are covering the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell. Uh, Hugo and I have, uh, have have worked a lot on this case, and we are joined today by a, an expert who has worked in investigations for years. It is Greg Rogers, who has worked uh, as a uh, an undercover FBI agent, uh, 20 plus years experience, and uh, we're grateful to have you joining us today, Greg, and uh, have you in studio. We are in different studios. We're looking at each other, a little odd here, but uh, but just to make it work technically here. And and Greg, I want to just start with uh, with your thoughts. You know, we're, we're at week three. This week we saw some of the uh, things like financial records brought up in this, but it seems to me like the real kind of uh, effort here by prosecutors is to piece together some of the work of investigators in this case. And there have been a lot in Arizona, in Hawaii, in Idaho, in Utah who've worked on this. Can you just give us kind of an inside look as far as when you have an interstate investigation like this, how does that work? Well, you have the cooperation of federal agencies like my old agency, the FBI, that can you know, we have offices in every state and a lot of international offices. So agents assist, um, even though this case is a, has state jurisdiction, the federal government doesn't have jurisdiction over homicides that happen just within a state, but we do um, assist in those cases and are happy to help. Um, you also have state and local agencies that assist, you know, all over the country. It's just that we can, we can do it quicker. It's just a phone call for the Idaho FBI to ask the Phoenix FBI or the Honolulu FBI to um, get involved and get out and follow leads. So you have just, you know, very willing state and local and federal agents all over the country that are happy to help in on a case like this, especially, you know, most of the investigation that was going on in this case early on, um, everybody was hoping that these two children were still alive. So yeah. they were getting on it quickly and uh, doing whatever they could to help. Well, Greg, I, I would like to know, I guess, you know, you see in movies and stuff where, uh, you know, it, there's a rivalry or one state wants to arrest the other. And something with, with this case in particular, there was a lot of, um, it, it didn't, immediately present as big as what it was. I mean, we right. dealt with the death of Charles Vallow first and how hard is it to, you know, when is that moment when you're like, well, oh, we need to now check interstate. Like what, what's that moment? Like when you realize, oh, this is a lot bigger than just one killing or one shooting mm -hmm. or one self-defense act. The, there's a whole lot that goes on behind the scenes that nobody ever sees. And one of the really important things that happened in this case is you have very talented profilers from the behavioral science unit of the FBI that come in and start looking um, at this case. And um, uh, I can assure you that when they looked at Mr. Daybell and Ms. Vallow, um, they were very concerned. They were very concerned that there was a whole lot more going on that they were just hiding these kids. They saw a case where there were already three dead spouses, two missing children, and um, the profilers would have been advising the agents and the uh, law enforcement officers working this case that there's a whole lot more going on here than, than appears. Do local agencies have to make the call to call the FBI into something like that? Or can the yes. FBI go to them and say, hey, I think you need our help? We, it works both ways, but we have very good relationships with, um, especially in Idaho, a lot of the agents that I worked with, I, I did a lot of cases in Idaho and um, um, undercover militia work. And we always had 
state and local guys helping on those. And so we have very good relationships with them. So it's not, it's nothing formal. It really is just like one of the detectives work in this case, just picks up a phone, calls one of his FBI buddies and says, can you guys help? This hmm. is going to be multi-state. Can, can you help out? And we, uh, in a police cooperation matter like that, we always say, yeah, whatever we can do. So, so going back to October 2019, right, or, or even before that, where you had, uh, you know, it, we think maybe September when Tylee was last seen. And uh, we saw a lot this week where uh, police were going through uh, kind of the records of it, how bank statements were, they were printing out bank statements and looking at how money was being spent. And, uh, and there was a lot of kind of looking at, you mentioned, you know, behind the scenes things that we all in the public were hearing, where are the kids? You know, we want to know where these kids are at the beginning of 2020. And uh, police have been looking at these people for a, a little bit. And uh, they had been asking for photos at Yellowstone and things like that. The last known time that these kids were seen in public in late 2019. So taking those, it seems like little bits of information, tiny little pieces that now help the prosecutors obviously make this case. But how do you know those pieces as you're you're searching for? Is it just, a, you know, you're looking for anything or do you, you know, what do you look for when you start a case like this? You're looking for anything that's going to help you um, identify where these children might be when you are still operating under the um, hope that they're still alive. Um, and, and I don't mean to sound like a cynic, although it's uh, been my tragic experience. Um, I can assure you there were a number of agents uh, in state and local investigators who already believe these children were deceased. And so you're doing anything you can to um, corroborate or to uh, show that the people that you're interviewing are, are not being honest. So you're trying to corroborate their story and or, uh, quite frankly, eviscerate it. And um, in this case, um, the agents and the local officers uh, didn't believe what um, Miss Vallow and Mr. Daybell were saying. So they were following business records, doing whatever they could to see, uh, for instance, if that money's being withdrawn and spent anywhere, that gives you some idea about locations where, where they were, at least where the adults were, hopefully meaning where the children were. Uh, something as silly as these days, it's very difficult to go anywhere uh, without there being cameras. So if any of those funds were expended at like a Walmart, the next thing you're doing is you're sending agents and cops there to uh, look at the security cameras to see who is there, to see who we, we've solved an a unbelievable number of cases that way. One of the biggest pieces of evidence in another serial killer case in Idaho, the Joseph Duncan case, uh, he bought items at a Walmart that were used in a murder and uh, zip ties, duct tape and a hammer. And we just had agents go and verify and you pulled video and um, we solve a lot of cases that way. So that's why they're doing mm -hmm. those sorts of things, uh, especially if um, if the parents were saying, oh, yeah, well, well, yeah, we spent the money there when they're confronted with that. And they say, oh, yeah, we spent the money at that Walmart but we had um, the kids with us, well, it's that's easy to verify or mm -hmm. to disprove. So that's why those things are being followed up on. That actually brings me to one of the more interesting points as well. I found this week with the uh, certain testimonies is a couple of officers that took the stand started to talk about, um, you know, some of the things that didn't add up with the original stories from both Laurie and, um, you know, Chad and, 
you know, part some of it involved when they went to the apartment block and they asked Laurie whether, um, you know, or whether Chad had Laurie's number and and that sort of thing, and they were quite blatantly getting caught in in lies. Right. As as an investigator yourself, um, is it? Do you know when someone's, you know, when you catch someone like that, or or is it? Do you always have to leave it up to well, we have to verify everything, like? You know, for the officer in front of Chad Daybell when he's asking those questions, mm-hmm. you know, is there a moment when he's like, oh, well, wow, we've got him here on something? Yeah. No, you – good agents and cops that have done, not exaggerating, literally thousands of interviews, you develop an ability to um, – you have a second sense about when someone's being helpful, when they're lying. That's not admissible in court. You know, you can't sit in court and say, well, my hunch was she was lying. You know, I mean, that doesn't mean anything, but it does affect the way you handle uh, that interview. And in her case specifically, in Lori's case, when you're asking her questions and she's not just bending over backwards, doing everything she can do to help you when her kids are missing, um, that speaks volumes. And mm. that that's going to affect the way you handle that interview. It's also going to affect um, whether you believe that those kids are in a safe place or not. Some of the charges that she's facing as well in this case are um, going back to some of the receipts and things like you were mentioning. Uh, you know, she's she's facing murder, conspiracy to murder, and also grand theft and uh, and using her kids' money. Does that also help you in an investigation? Uh, you know, when you're saying, well, you know, the, the kids aren't spending money buying a swimsuit in Hawaii uh, <laughs> when they're not in Hawaii and things like right. that. Do, do you look at that? And then also in your experience, have you seen that impact cases and, and how it actually works out in the the actual, you know, the trial? Yeah, no. And the reason that that's charged, even though some people think it's kind of silly to charge a theft when you're also charging, uh, you know, first degree murders, you're charging those because you want to get that evidence in. And um, without that charge being in the indictment, it's difficult for some of that evidence to get admitted. Um, So you want to get it in. You want the jury to see that she was being knowingly deceitful um, after her children were already deceased and she knew it. And so that's why those charges are there. And um, it's it's not uncommon. I, I could take your entire day telling you about cases where people have um, told just ridiculous lies. And it's, it often starts because there's an original lie and now they've got to support that. And they've got, they, they know they've already said one thing and now they got to live with that. So they've got to keep lying on top of that. So once that happens, um, you know, it's very beneficial for us because it's, they're going to keep lying. Yeah. Some of Lori's friends and, and connections have uh, testified in court. Specifically, we heard last week from Melanie Gibb. And uh, and maybe that was earlier. This It's all starting to blend already for me. But um, but she was told, uh, according to her, that, you know, to, to lie to police and to say that she had JJ when she didn't, and even to told her that she needed to go to the movie theater and take pictures of kids to show that she had been at the movie theater to kind of corroborate these these things that Lori was telling police. And we actually saw that interview this week, just yesterday, where she told that lie to police. And uh, when you have someone that's you know not going along with that, and is that great for building your case? Do you just get so happy when you have a friend that comes forward or someone like that that's, uh, you know, that's saying all of these things? How do you kind of take those interviews and handle that when it seems like someone is is turning against someone that they're, you know, quote unquote, friends with? No, that's again, that's great evidence uh, uh, for a jury. But what what it also shows is, is the 
extent of manipulation uh, that Lori was willing to go to and to put her friends, literally having her friends commit felonies to protect her. And it's one thing to ask your friend. I I, I can assure you that Lori convinced her that um, the kids were safe. They're just trying to hide them from the cops because the grandparents want to get them. She was doing that whole line. So that's how she manipulated her friend. But as soon as it's discovered that those children are dead, you go right back to that friend and you re-interview her because the odds of her trying to protect Lori now are slim. Hmm. So it's one thing to help your friend out in a child custody dispute with relatives, and you can convince them that these relatives are horrible people uh, and that they're terrible for your kids and you're just trying to hide your kids for them. That's something you could get a friend to believe. But when the kids are dead in, in the horrible condition they were in, that's a whole different thing. I wanted to um, sort of uh, just uh, ask you some questions. Uh, for those who don't know, Greg was undercover for many years working in, um, you know, narcotics gangs, white supremacy gangs. So he has a very good understanding of, um, I guess, group crime and that sort of uh, that mentality around, you know, the the organization and and but also that group mentality. And, and in this case, you see a lot of elements like that when it's particularly when it comes to Alex Cox, the, the brother, right. Can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, that, how that manipulation, that control really plays into a, like, how do you convince someone whether Lori, we don't know whether Lori was there when the children died or not. Um, there's a lot of speculation around who actually did it and that sort of thing. Right. How, how do you convince someone like that? Or, or where does that sort of power come from? I think Lori's, um, established over her entire life when you look at her history that she's she has been very effective at um getting what she wanted and had very uh unfortunately very impressive skills of manipulation and um uh when you talk to a uh former friends and uh those sorts of people that have come out and talked about her now she's She's always an established an ability to get just what she wants. And tragically, she's also established an ability to eliminate um, anybody that's in her way to include ex-spouses, children. I mean, she has a marked um, lack of remorse for uh, doing whatever she needs to do to get what she wants. And so she's a highly effective manipulator and um, is clearly demonstrated that and um, um, to include being perfectly fine with having her children killed because, quite frankly, to her, they were just a nuisance. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I've, have you ever seen anything like this before in your career, this sort of this type of case or any similarities in other ones? Yeah, no, I've worked a, a number of serial killer cases. I've had a I've had people hire me uh, in an undercover capacity to kill relatives, and uh, uh, I had a physician in Idaho, ironically in Pocatello, hire me, and he gave me a script of uh, things he wanted me to say to his wife before I killed her, so that she would know. Um, why she was being killed. And I, I wouldn't go into detail because it was horrible. The things he wanted me to do to his wife and the things he wanted me to say to her. Um, I of course told him it's not going to go like that. That's how you get caught. You know, I'm going to, you know, I was undercover. So I just tell him, look, I'll take care of her, but I'm going to be several hundred yards away. And, uh, um, but no, so I've dealt with people who have absolutely are devoid of conscience and um, uh, believe they can get whatever they want. This guy was a very well-heeled physician and uh, just thought, you know, he was going through a nasty divorce and he couldn't tolerate it. He found it insulting. So, I mean, yeah, I've dealt with plenty of people like that and uh, they believe they can manipulate people into doing whatever they want to do and uh, they can get what they want and they um, 
they just lack any conscience at all. They don't lose a minute of sleep over it. Hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, I think, been one of the things that has uh, kind of disturbed people about this case is looking at Lori's reactions. Obviously, they're looking to see, uh, you know, how do they look in court? How do the, the you know, Chad and Lori both react in court when they hear the charges and things like that. And, uh, you know, she's we, we've seen kind of the gambit of emotions from super happy and, and smiley to last week breaking down in tears. And uh, and so, you know, emotion, we know, will play a role in, in how the jury kind of investigates. But uh, I, I wonder, too, does it impact you working on these cases as you've talked? You know, how do you because because even for us hearing about this case, we've talked about how it's uh, it is it is disturbing and these details are disturbing. Do you have any maybe tips for us or for our listeners on, you know, taking that and, and being healthy and, and managing through it? Um, my, my trick always was, and, uh, the, the FBI is very good about this. When you work undercover as much as I did, they make you go to, uh, see psychologists every six months to make sure you're not going off the rails and, uh, take all sorts of tests and get therapy. But aside from that, which I, I respected and appreciated that the FBI did that, but, um, that's not what, uh, worked best for me. I, uh, I think you just have to um, remove yourself from it. Like after a meeting with, um, uh, you know, uh, in a hitman case or something like that, when I'm meeting with these horrible human beings, or more importantly, I worked a lot of child sex tourism matters in Southeast Asia. So I'd have to be pretending to be a pedophile all day, you know? And so you get, you get back to the hotel at two or three in the morning after partying with these guys and you got to do something to, clear your head. So I always found um, uh, having a really well-written novel uh, and uh, I play guitar, so I'd have my guitar. You just try to do something normal and worthwhile. Or yeah, it, it, Some of my buddies would just watch TV. I mean, you just do anything to get it out of your head. And um, I just found reading and playing music worked well for me because you got to, um, yeah, you know, when you do stuff like that, that um, hopefully most normal human beings that are mentally healthy should never have to uh, see or participate in. Um, yeah, you got to clean your head. I used to feel guilty for juries. I mean, I honestly, I'm not being melodramatic. I used to feel terrible for them on some of these cases because we'd have, you know, you'd have these really nice folks over there that had up until they got selected for jury duty had uh, probably never even heard about most of the stuff we were going to be talking about. You'd have to go into graphic detail with them. And, you know, you'd look over there at someone who looked like your grandmother and you just feel guilty about telling him about this horrible thing. Mm -hmm. And um, um, yeah. And you would wonder what they were going to do to uh, feel better about it that night, you know? Yeah, Greg, just while we've got you and, and before we wrap it up, that that was actually uh, a dot point that we had down that we wanted to ask you about. We we heard a lot of the testimony from the officers who found the bodies as well. Right. Um, now, obviously, in court, it's very, we looked here, this is why we looked here, this is what we found. But for someone who's actually been in that uniform next to that hole, what what's uh, what, what's going through their head when they're finding those first bone fragments or that sort of thing? You... Um... Um, while you're doing it, um, you are so focused, especially on a case like this, because the forensics of that find is so vitally important. You have to be unbelievably careful because you might get DNA, you might get fingerprints, you, you don't know. So you are so focused on doing your job professionally, um, that that's what you're doing in the moment. But um, when you get in your car and you're driving home, when you're done, um, you're probably going home to your own kids. Um, and um, it, it weighs on you. So you uh, you don't get over it and you don't. Uh, um, yeah, it weighs on you. And you um, 
I, I teach a class at Utah Valley University, and I tell my students all the time when they ask about um, things like that. I'm like, look, you know, because they they're it's in the criminal justice department. They all want to be cops. And I'm like, look, you're going to see things and you're going to participate in things that um, you never imagined. And uh, you got to come up with a way to uh, deal with those or else you get in a bad place yourself. And so um, um, and luckily, I think most departments recognize that there's things available if you need uh, help outside of your buddies, but you mm. got to come up with a personal way to deal with that kind of stuff because those those bodies were in horrific shape and they're children. And you, um, as a cop, you like to think that you can prevent that kind of stuff from happening, but there's uh, um, there's evil in the world and it's going to happen. And uh, when it does, it's your job to uh, um, prove how and why it happened. And um Take the people who did it to justice. It's that simple. Yeah, Greg, actually, you just touched on something that I, I just want to really quickly ask you about. I know I said we were mm -hmm. going to wrap this up. Sorry, mm -hmm. Amy. But I'd like, Amy, I think you agree with this. One thing um, I've noticed in a lot of these cases is there's always a comment about, um, oh, the, you know, the police didn't treat the scene properly or they didn't do this properly or that sort of thing. Where you, You're not hearing that with this case. And I'm wondering, is that really good training is that the length of time that this has played out over or is it because um, Laurie Vallow and Chad Daybell just gave them a sense that, well, there could be something a lot more to this. And, and so they were just that little bit extra prepared. What, what do you think? It's, it's a combination, but the almost all police departments now and the FBI certainly does. And we, we assist in these types of cases, crime scene teams. Now, early in my career, for instance, I was working on the Navajo reservation in, in 2000, 2001, 2002. And even that recently, you know, when you're my age, that doesn't seem like that long ago. Again, it's funny when I'm talking, seven. yeah, when I'm talking <laughs> to my students, I realize a lot of them weren't even on the planet yet, but it's, uh, but it's, um, uh, back then we were the crime scene. I mean, there were FBI agents, there were three of us down there. We'd go out on a crazy homicide scene and we were the crime scene team. Now we, you know, that's not the case anymore. Now, thankfully, um, every FBI office, every major police department, every state police department, Idaho State Police have very, very intensively trained crime scene teams. So guys like me now, if I were still working, if I got out on a homicide team, uh, scene, my only job would be taping it off and waiting for the crime scene team to show up. And these people that are unbelievably specialized, you'll have a uh, fingerprint folks, DNA folks. I mean, people that are very, very specialized come out and take care of that. And, um, and that's required now, quite frankly, juries expect it because that's what they see on TV. And, uh, so, um, it's very, they're very, very well done. And, you know, in a case like this, again, this case is largely circumstantial until they discover those bodies. So, you know, that's going to be a huge issue in trial and you just got to do it very, very well. You can't make mistakes. Well, well, we're grateful for uh, the, the work of those officers and uh, grateful for your work uh, and your expertise to uh, to explain all of this to us. I, it's hard to cut you off because it's so... Oh, it's my it's, pleasure. It's been, it's been interesting. <laughs> it's been very interesting for us and hopefully for our, our listeners as well. And uh, we'll continue to follow this uh, this trial and uh, we'll, we'll follow and, and see what happens. Expecting eight weeks, they're off today. For court, uh, no session because they're moving so quickly. So that's not what we were really expecting with this case. Um, again, I'm KSL News Radio's Amy Kobabe, joined by Hugo Ricard Bell. And uh, our expert today is Greg Rogers, former FBI agent. And uh, he's done a lot of undercover work, and uh, we really appreciate it. So thank you, Greg. My pleasure. Thanks.